I was really lucky to get into birding almost by chance. When I was a little kid, I liked to look at picture books about nature. I'd look at pictures of bears and tigers and dinosaurs, and then I'd go out and wander around our neighborhood in Indiana. I could never find any of those things. So about the time I was six, I decided that, well, I'll take a day or two and see if I can figure out what these birds are. And I've been working on that ever since. My parents have always encouraged me to be outside. I remember when I was two or three, we'd be in the ravine behind my house, just turning over rocks and looking for salamanders. So it really wasn't a surprise when one day they asked me if I wanted to go out and look for ducks. I think they've regretted that day ever since because I kept incessantly asking them to go out and look for ducks after that. My earliest memory of actually making an identification was of an American Red Start. I was homesick from kindergarten and I saw a bird that I had remembered seeing in a book and I was just amazed by the fact that that little bird there in the tree looked just like this picture in the book. I think kids love birds because they are obvious and conspicuous in the environment and everywhere. My guess is that that's their first experience with, with nature is watching a bird and by the, by the way they can fly. Even now when I see birds it makes me think that someday I'm going to be able to fly too. Honestly, what really drew me in and what really kind of clicked for me was when I saw a yellow shafted flicker, northern flicker, in my backyard. I mean, here's a bird that, you know, for all intents and purposes, looks like a clown. It's got these spots on it. It's got this red stripe on the back. It's got a mustache near the bill. That northern flicker was, for me, just sort of like, wow, this is, we're onto something here. One of the first times I took Jake birding actually was, it was around Christmas time, yeah. maybe about five years ago. I think it was and we, January. And we had heard there was a, a northern solid owl that was roosting in, back in the tangles here. And so he's tiny, he's like He's a little big. guy, but fierce. It's very much detective work. You've got the song of the bird, you've got how it's behaving, you've got its plumage, of course. That's part of what the appeal is, figuring out this little mini puzzle that could take 10 seconds or even just the flit of an eye, or it could take, you know, an hour. There he is. There he is. It used to be the old image of birders was, so to speak, little old ladies in tennis shoes or wizened old men with an old pair of binoculars, but actually today there are millions and millions of birders that come in all flavors, all sizes, all shapes, and all personalities. There's no such thing as the average or typical birder. I think everyone is a birder somewhere deep down inside and you just have to unlock that door for them. I'm not, I'm not that superstitious. I don't have my lucky underwear. I don't have my lucky hat. A lot of birders will have like their hat with all their birding pins on it. I don't really have any set rituals. I just try to remember my binoculars, try to remember my field notebook and go out there with a clear mind and keen senses. A lot of the time when I'm walking around in the woods, I'm just carrying binoculars, but when I get out to an open spot like a marsh or like an open mud flat or something, the edge of a lake, I'll have a telescope along because this sort of spotting scope brings them in close enough to really tell what they are. The first uh, three or four years of my birding life, I did not have a pair of binoculars and I did not have a field guide. So what happened is that I had to use my notes to run back to the library find out what I was seeing and, and then come up with an identification. If I'm doing the math correct, I've been taking notes on birds for about 30 years now. A lot of bird watching is actually bird listening, so we're constantly listening for the sounds of things that are singing and calling back in the woods. I'll often just stop and take in things like the chickadee just called. And there's actually chickadees calling to each other right now. And a nut hatch and a goldfinch overhead. So I have a digital recorder here, and uh, I also have headphones to listen to what I'm recording. A shotgun uh, microphone is really good for focusing on individual birds. I like to keep track of the birds that I'm recording as my specimens, let's say, of what I'm recording. Every single time we go birding, I always bring a bagel. <laughs> it's choice. just my breakfast. This is a great egret. It's a fantastic bird. It's uh, all white plumage and it is moving slowly through this marsh. It's hunting. I think we might get a better view of it over here. Oh, there he is. That's it, there he is. He's moving right through the reeds here. Very methodically, doesn't seem to notice us. Look at that, it's got a bright yellow eye, just sitting perfectly still. Oh, opened its bill there. What is it doing now? Look, oh, did you see that? 
That was amazing. It just went out and snapped a dragonfly off a flower right in front of its head. That was incredible. Oh, there he goes. Nice. You know, birding is, is so addictive uh, once somebody gets hooked on it that it actually, it does turn some people into absolute crazy people. I was a pretty serious lister for a while, which is when you go out and you really want to get a bird on your list, whether it's your life list or your North American list or your Michigan list, or some people even do it down to township lists. I've never quite gotten to that point. Every bird that you see that you can identify, you put on a list. My life list, I believe, is 518 compared to mine of 350. There, yeah, you're getting there though. Oh yeah. Uh, there are birds, even professionals like me, haven't seen. I can't, I don't know why, but I've, uh, I've whiffed on Lawrence's goldfinch probably a dozen times now in California. I still haven't seen that bird. There are people that hear about a bird that shows up in maybe New Jersey that hasn't been seen in North America before, and they will hop on a plane and they'll go see that bird just so they can get it on their list. Good friends that have birded together for a while um, love to be the first to spot something. It, it gets everybody else on a little higher alert. There are people who actually will spend the entire year, every single day, trying to see as many birds as they can. Then on uh, January 1st of the next year, well, they start over. I suppose you could call me a type B, you know, uh, just very um, casual, happy to see common species in the local neighborhood. And I will not fly across the country to see a particular species, even if it's something I've never seen before. The, uh, the year that I turned 19, I decided to try to break the record for the most number of bird species seen in one year in North America. So I spent the whole year of 1973 just hitching rides around North America. I was writing this down in January of 1973, and I can look at this and see how many Gila woodpeckers I saw in this area just outside Phoenix and who I was birding with and what the weather was like. It was an incredible adventure and by the end of that time the number wasn't important at all because what was important was the experience that I had but eventually I wound up writing a book about it uh, just just to get it off my chest. We've had, we call them adventures, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's certainly some adventures. One time we drove four hours just to see <laughs> one bird. Well, not one bird, but one, was one specific bird, the greater prairie chicken. Yeah. So there is this kind of uh, striving for something that you can't quite get uh, often, and then suddenly you get reinforced by these brilliant and beautiful species that you've been looking for for so long that you've finally found, so it's a, uh, it's a little like gambling, you know. We were just flying down the road and happened to look over at a pond and there was a lump kind of sitting where there wasn't supposed to be a lump. The fact that he's perch hunting makes me think that it probably is a red tail just sitting down there quietly hoping that some little tasty morsel would come by the pond. What is it about birds? You know, I see it as fabulous composition, great shapes, and I want to be in communion with something really wonderfully made. And what could be better made than a bird? When you begin to pay attention to birds, or to dragonflies, or to butterflies, but, but particularly birds because they're everywhere, you just begin to open your eyes in a different way. And that is a life skill that goes well beyond birds. It's no accident that almost all of the major principles in ecology and behavior and natural resource management began with people watching birds. When the first specimens were put into our collections more than 150 years ago, people put specimens in this institution to document what lived in the places that they had visited. And that's the exact same thing we do now, too. But now we have incredible technologies that enable us to explore birds in ways we couldn't have known about 150 years ago. Because we know so much about birds already, we can use it to understand birds in a different way than we can other organisms that we're still just learning about. And we can use that to study interactions between birds and their surroundings, interactions between birds and other organisms, and how they've adapted. Charles Darwin actually discovered some of the principles of evolution by looking at birds in the Galapagos and other places. So we learn a lot about the whole fabric of natural systems by watching birds. If you are a bird watcher, you can contribute records to collective repositories. I can think of eBird, for example. So here's, here's what I've got. I've got this thing called bird log, and we're going to submit sightings, okay? So start. And so here we go. Because birds' distributions are changing all the time, there's no way that scientists could keep track of where birds are found. That's a catbird. Oh, yeah. 
I see a goldfinch over there. Okay, good. Goldfinch, American gold. Yep, good. The fact that there are hundreds of thousands of amateur birders out there keeping track of their sightings really makes it possible to know what's going on with bird populations. Do you hear that chickadee? Uh, oh, cool. Tufted titmouse. Where? Right up there in the tree. You Where? The top of the tree moving around. Oh, I got him. Yeah. The reason we're excited is, to be honest, it's the first time we've ever seen tufted titmouse on, on the Chicago lakefront. So citizen science really can be for everybody, whether it's just your backyard or for the most serious birders who go out for day-long trips, accumulating enormous lists of birds that they see in all their different places. Here comes the Caspian Tern. Right over, yeah. And with fish. Yeah. Which means that it's going to feed its young. I just love birds. And when you look at things like this, I can't imagine why anybody would study anything else. So the question is, what is it that jazzes you about your life the way birds do me? I find that every time I come back from birding, whether it's from leading a bird walk or just going off by myself, I have more questions than answers. And for me, that is a wonderful state to be in, <laughs> to be constantly in a state of inquiry. I don't usually see him much because he's working. So I don't see him as Typical much dad, right? as my mom. <laughs> but when we're out here, it's just awesome to be with him. When you study such fascinating organisms as birds, you start to really envy some of the cool things that they get to do. As you can see, I'm pregnant, and birds are just so elegant in them. They just get to lay an egg and sit on them, incubate them, but still get to fly around and do things normally. And um, I really wish I could do that. If someone says the word birds to me, the first thing that comes to mind for me, I would have to say love. I love birds, but birds also brought me together with the absolute love of my life. So for me, birds mean love. I guess the one thing I'd love everybody to know about birds is that every one of those birds is an individual too. Every single bird you look at has its own story. For me, just kind of the epitome of joy is just being out in a woodlot where there's just nobody else out there and it's migration and there's birds on your right and birds on your left and birds on the trail in front of you. It kind of invokes, I guess you could say, some primitive feelings, but I just, I feel like I'm part, part of nature and part of the world. We all hunger for beauty <laughs> in this world and uh, they're such creatures of beauty. Birds are like us, but sort of spiritual. You know, they can do something we can't, which is, sort of amazing, really. That's why angels have wings, I think. For me, birds just represent the intensity of life. Uh, they represent the, the best of what it means to be alive, and being in love is a big part of that. But if, uh, if I found out that I had one minute left to live, I would want to hold hands with Kimberly, and I would want both of us to be looking at some beautiful bird for that minute. Thank you.